So much death. What can men do against such reckless hate? Every day, literally hundreds of thousands of young men and about three women battle it out in an endless conflict on CSGO. Heads are shot, bodies are teabagged, yet nothing is ever resolved. One man isn't enough to change things. That was pretty clear in the previous episode. But what about a whole team of people? I set out with JFCC, Balthazar, Hayugami and Hazda's Monkey to put an end to the conflict, once and for all, to see if peace can prevail. Welcome to Going Low in CSGO. Let's roll. Prior to the first round, we politely requested peace before heading to middle to greet them. Unfortunately, negotiations failed but we weren't going to be deterred so easily. We tried the ancient Babylonian peace pyramid. But that didn't work either. We tried the Peruvian death stare, where we remained completely still. But no. So we tried a variant of the Caligula's Cuddle. But that didn't work either. But no, that didn't work either. This was turning out to be harder than we had expected. We tried everything, but the other team continued to pick us off like flies. They found delight in inflicting suffering. But what were we to do? Were we to stoop down to their level? No, we took it like the men that we are. We employed smokes to make it more difficult for them. These rounds went by, and yet their bloodlust was relentless. They mowed us down time after time.
Finally, Balthazar had had enough and he ran. like he was shot and blood came out. If he were a ketchup packet then there would have been sauce everywhere. Speaking of sauce, let's go back in time. Back to 2004 and the release of Counter-Strike Sauce. Now you see people moaning about how CSGO doesn't get many updates, but do you know what it was like for this game? It got a year of decent and frequent updates. A year after that, far fewer, and after that, practically non-existent. Then suddenly in 2010 there was a large orange box update, which polished almost every bit of the game and added a load of achievements. But it came a bit too late for me since most of my playtime and stats were from before this. But still, let's look back at those first few years of updates for Source. The most memorable ones were the addition of new maps. First to be added was Prodigy, a dark, very CT-sided map. I never liked it, though it was popular in the 2v2 and 3v3 ladders that we often fought on. I even had a frustrating dream on it where I felt increasingly sick every time I was shot, then I woke up and vomited for 24 hours. Some say it was food poisoning, but I know it was Prodigy's doing. I still can't stand that map. The game got bot support in early 2005, as well as a new map called Tides, which had references to Turtle Rock Studios everywhere. It was beautiful, but I never learned it that well since it wasn't played much competitively, but there are still weird 64-man servers where dozens of Silver Ones are massed to battle on occasionally. We then got Compound and Train. Train needs no introduction. It was a complex and messy map, but we had some good games on it. I personally loved Compound, a hostage map set in a humble looking compound. It didn't even have a 3D skybox. The setting wouldn't have been out of place in Half-Life 2. It quickly became my favorite hostage map due to its open-ended design and relative simplicity. I hope that one day it will return to CSGO. I still load this one up occasionally to relive the memories that I've had within its walls. Around this time, they also updated the player models. In very early CSS skill videos, they appear hunched over, though this change was done before I really got into the game. May was a big month for the game. First, David Johnston released D-Dust PCG, which is as close to an official Dust 3 as we're ever going to get. It was made for the PC Gamer magazine and never became that popular, but I'm proud to have been there as it was released. Next up were two official maps. The first was Inferno. It's hard to imagine Counter-Strike without this map, but for the first half year, Source didn't. This version slowed PCs down everywhere, particularly when grenades went off in the apartments, sending debris flying in all directions. In some ways, it's better than what we have today. Terrorist Spawn has a second exit, stopping stuff like this from happening. We also got Port, which I had high hopes for, but it ultimately sucked. It was just too big, sprawling and messy. The update also made it take half a second before moving your crosshair over a player showed their name. I believe that before this, you could see where enemies were through smoke grenades simply by scanning your crosshair across them. We then got Assault, which quickly became a fan favourite despite being like, the most terror-sided map ever. My only memory of this was enabling wireframe on our server to shoot people through the walls, which damaged our team's already damaged reputation. It was the last map to be released before the HDR update. The Lost Coast tech demo showcased this new technology, but it wasn't until Nuke was added at the end of 2005 that Counter-Strike players were able to see it in action. It obliterated frame rates and made it even harder to see people in the dark corners of the map, but fortunately you could disable it. Thing is, I didn't because it was pretty and my sub-20 FPS probably doomed our team on many of the matches that we played. And finally, at the beginning of 2006 we got Militia, by far the prettiest and laggiest of the source maps. I don't remember it being too bad to play on, but it was used more as a stress test for our computers. When Tommy TTK got himself a GeForce 7800, he impressed me by running it at over 80 frames a second, even with a flashlight on. I'll never forget. And that's it. A year and a bit after the game's first release, it got its last new map. That would have been like CSGO getting its final map in 2013. Of course, there were numerous bug fixes and other additions both during and after that time. I think that at some point they patched up the map DX level 6 command which made the game look like it was from the 90s, which we used at the time to get acceptable performance. 
Dust and Train also got upgraded to HDR during 2006, and we got numerous skins to choose from, including my favourite, the Leet models. Any decent team would all choose the same model, for questionable tactical advantages, but not ours. What surprises me is how little the weapons were changed. In Global Offensive, hardly a week goes by without the community demanding that X needs buffing or that Y needs nerfing, or whatever. At the end of 2006, the pistols in Source got damage buffs, but aside from that, the guns remained the same throughout the whole of Counter-Strike Source's lifetime. Compared with Global Offensive, Source was unloved and its updates poorly planned. And as these updates got fewer and further between, I'd welcome anything with open arms. I fantasised about it getting a new map or graphical effect, or even a sequel. As the years went by, it became increasingly difficult to recommend it over other series. Even Call of Duty's new Game Every Year model seemed appealing compared with the sorry, neglected state of CSS. And yet we still remained faithful to it for years, even despite the dynamic weapon pricing update, which I'll save for later. So just remember this the next time that Valve changes something you don't like, or doesn't update the game every week. It could be far, far worse. And having experienced both, I'd take Global Offensive over Source any day. The first half neared its end and we walked into middle one last time, expecting a bloodbath. But it didn't come. We were greeted by the other team, which had finally laid down their weapons and for one beautiful moment, there was peace between the two sides. And then one guy came along and ruined everything. It was fun while it lasted. But what's this? Hazda's monkey had slipped through their lines and was close to winning the round for us. But was this an act of defiance? Was this in the spirit of going low? No! Yes! No! Well, maybe, but it was too late and we missed our chance to win against all of the odds. They returned to their old, brutal ways and the game soon ended. Peace had failed. There was only one option left.